Good morning from our world headquarters in New York. I'm Manis Cranny. And from our studios in London, I'm Danny Berger. Welcome to Bloomberg Brief. Let's set your agenda. A chorus of hawkish Fed comments dislocates the bombs. Loretta Mester suggests rates may be higher for longer. At this point, I suspect we may well need to raise the Fed funds rate once more this year and then hold it there for some time as we accumulate more information on economic developments and assess the effects of the tightening in financial conditions that has already occurred. Meanwhile, in Australia, the Aussie slides as the RBA keeps rates unchanged, but says some further tightening may be required. And Kevin McCarthy's job is on the line. Fellow Republican Matt Gates officially moved to topple the High Speaker, teeing up a vote that may shift Washington's balance of power. Very good morning. The balance of power is still with the bond vigilantes, that's for sure. But it almost feels as if the ligature, which is around the bond market over the past five days, has loosened ever so slightly. Yields come off their zenith, the 2007 high for the 10-year paper. ING this morning said the pushback by the Fed and those voices that you hear in the past 24 hours is against that rate protest that you have. The market is not keeping up with where the Fed want you to be. Now, the euro trashed and crashed yesterday by nearly 1% as the musculature of the dollar was really felt. Higher rates, higher dollar, and that momentum was there. Is there, is there a, a disconnection from reality in the bond market as far as the euro is concerned? Nomura said yesterday on surveillance, it feels like we should be at 101 to 103 already. Philip Lane comes out this morning, the chief economist, and says there is more work to be done. It's going to be hard to sustain lower gas prices. So we see this small inflection and move higher in the the euro. The oil market is flat at the moment, but you can see we're just in the midst of trying to decide. We were down for four days in a row. We dipped below this $90 level on the yield spike and the dollar dislocation. It feels as if, or it felt as if, some of these markets were at a breaking point. Cities Ed Moore says $70 is a possible uh, price on the oil market. As Masrui at Adipec, the, uh, the UAE oil minister, says we're in the right place for OPEC policy. Danny. Man, it's just when you think you've wrapped your head around oil, another twist and turn in that narrative with it dropping below 90. The other debate we're having in this equity market, Manis, is do we care about higher rates? Can equities charge higher, even if we're talking about 10-year yields at 4.7%? MSCI Asia Pacific, not so a tough session. China's off the map. It is golden week for the Chinese equity market for the region. So we're trading at the lowest level of this year for the MSCI Asia Pacific. We're down 30% from the top. Morgan Stanley says global funds have cut their China exposure to the lowest since 2020. Now, for the rest of this equity market, Europe claws back from a negative day yesterday. Just barely, though. I mean, we're basically unchanged. And S&P 500 futures, they're higher after ending higher yesterday. But, man, this is the divide. It's really well encapsulated by Bank of America and Morgan Stanley. So Vita Subramanian over at Bank of America says that, yes, we can move higher, even if rates are higher for longer. But Mike Wilson, who's always bearish over at Morgan Stanley, says, no, like me on a bad day, stocks have had a change in personality, a distinct <laughs> change of personality is what he calls it. And they care about rates, Manis. There's no schizophrenia on this show, absolutely not. We're two very well-centred <laughs> people at 3 a.m. in the morning when, we come, when I come totally. in here. Um, look, the debate is this, is, is what price do bonds need to go to to clear the upcoming supply? We'll talk about that with Mako Papik in a moment. But we both struck by what Ed Yudani had to say, and this was it. The, the man who christened bond vigilantes that we've quoted so often. The worry is that the escalating federal budget deficit will create more supply of bonds than demand can meet, requiring higher yields to clear the market. That worry has been the bond vigilante's entrance queue. Now, that is not the view of our bond guest in 45 minutes from Clock Tower, but that is Yadani laying out the roadmap. Danny. Yeah, and I love what he continues to say that is this on the Fed's radar, Manus? If higher yields aren't yet on the Fed radar, then they should be. Exactly. And that's the concern about the constriction of FCON. Let's take those thoughts to our guest host this morning. It is Remy Olupitan, uh, fund manager over at Schroeder's. Remy, good to see you this morning. Um, should the Fed now be worried about this? It almost feels as if, as, as JP Morgan say, the bond market has become dislocated from its typical drivers. Is it showing signs of dislocation to you? Good morning. Good morning, Manis. Um, not at the moment, because actually we think that this is what the Fed wants. 
Um, what we need to be careful of is the speed and the level. But I do think a slight increase in bond yields is consistent with what the Fed is trying to do. They've made it quite clear that further rate hikes are still on the table and that yields will be higher for longer. And as a consequence, the 10-year was quite dislocated and really was struggling to accept that. Yeah. And I think what we have seen is some acceptance. Yeah, I mean, it's a great point because we've been saying for how long the, the bond market hasn't woken up to higher for longer. Now that it has, we're all of a sudden all freaking out that it's woken up. So tell me, when should I freak out, Remy? At, at what level do I get worried? Um, to be brutally honest, we think that it's starting to look quite attractive now at 4.7. But there's always risk of mistakes. And typically with markets, things do overshoot. The 5% level is quite a scary level. We also need to focus on real yields because that is where you're getting the transmission. I mean, there has been some concern that monetary tightening hasn't been transmitting into the US economy. Now that we're seeing long dated bond yields rise and real yields rise, I think that's coming through. So 5% is a number to be wary of and 2.5 on the US 10 year real yield is a number to be wary of as well. OK, so you've put your stake very clearly down, 2.5% on the real yield. What would that do to tech? And the reason why I ask you that, Danny, myself and the team have been looking at some of the balance sheets, uh, and a big shout-out to Dan Curtis on this, the balance sheets within tech. If you look at the cash that Meta has, 53 billion bucks, Apple has 167 billion bucks, with real rates going to 2.5%, which is a risk, as you say, in the market, do these balance sheets bolster against that real rate at 2.5%. Is that enough to bolster big tech? We think that that's enough to bolster big tech. I mean, these balance sheets are in a very strong position. Nevertheless, there's an issue with regards to the price and what is the right price. And I think that that's the debate markets a lot of investors are having because with higher real yields, there's that opportunity cost, the valuation debate. I think that that's what's causing this temporary headwind for tech. Once we get through that, investors will start to focus on the fundamentals. A lot of these companies are in a very strong position, but there are a lot a lot of weak hands, not in tech, but in other sectors. Can I also show you something else that, that's a little bit puzzling for me? Perhaps, perhaps on the other side of things it, are junk spreads right now. I mean, they've tightened significantly this year despite everything, banking crisis, what have you. Triple Cs are at 848 basis points. Prior recessions, they're usually around 2,000. Should we be bracing for something much worse in this junk market. Yeah, that is puzzling. I mean, there are two things that we have to recognize with regards to junk spreads at the moment. Again, similar to the argument on tech, a lot of these companies are in a strong position. I mean, they really benefited from very low um, rates for many, many years, and they were able to really sort out their balance sheets and extend the term of their financing. So just starting from the starting point, they're in a strong position. We do have a wall of issuance coming towards the end of next year, early 2025, so that will cause some tantrums and there should be some widening of spreads. But a lot of investors are looking at the absolute yields. And at the moment, those absolute yields are really attractive, specifically relative to everything else you can mm. own. And so I think that that is driving some demand. And, and that, that is the conundrum, isn't it? Whether you want to take high-grade credit, let's say, with less volatility than equity. With that in mind, where does credit sit for you? So we have been nervous about credit, particularly high grade, for part of the reasons you've mentioned, but also the duration. Because we think that the volatility has changed. Um, a lot of the high grade, high quality investment grade credit, um, particularly in the US, you're looking at a duration of seven to eight years. So actually what you are trading is nominal bonds with a little bit of a spread. So a lot of the performance has been driven by the volatility in rates. So you're not really getting that corporate um, fundamental benefits that you want. And I think that that's one of the reasons why high yield bonds have performed quite well, because they have less duration sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And as long mm -hmm. as we feel that the US economy will remain resilient for a bit longer, these bonds can outperform. How much of that is tied to energy, too? A lot of these companies are obviously energy companies, too, and oil that's prices fair. 
flirting with $100 a barrel. That is fair. That is fair. I think you're right in that the composition of some of these, um, of the credit universe has changed and you do have a lot of sectors, particularly within energy, that are in a very strong position. They are seeing an increase in their share prices and that gives a lot of investors some confidence. I think what we have right now is, again, about this debate with higher bond yields and how we as investors need to accept this and deal with the reality of the next couple of years. I mean, even if we do see um, bond yields coming back, I doubt whether we're going to see the ones and two percents that we were used to many, many years ago. And so we do have to be more discerning. Mm. Um, the way we look at asset classes has to change. And there are some interesting assets that can survive this. Yeah, a new regime, but I mean, one we can live with, one we can definitely find opportunities in. Remy? I don't think we have a choice. <laughs> Very well put. Remy, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Thanks so much for joining. That's Remy Olupitan of Schroeder's. Now, here's some other stories, some top stories that we are tracking this morning. J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon says artificial intelligence is already being used by thousands of employees at his bank and is likely to make dramatic improvements in the workers' quality of life, even if it eliminates some jobs. He spoke exclusively with Bloomberg yesterday. Technologies always replace jobs. Your children are going to live to 100 and not have cancer because of technology. And literally, they'll probably be working three and a half days a week. So technology has done unbelievable things for mankind. But, you know, planes crash, pharmaceuticals get misused. There are negatives. This one, the biggest negative, in my view, is AI being used by bad people to do bad things. And another Bloomberg scoop. Taiwanese companies are helping Huawei build infrastructure for a secret network of chip plants across southern China at a time when China threatens Taiwan regularly with military action. The island's tech companies may be helping U.S.-sanctioned Huawei develop chips to effectively break the American blockade. I mean, elsewhere in Asia, Evergrande soared as a return from a trading halt, driven by what appears to be bets on a penny stock, even as the developer's fate hangs in the balance amid an official probe into, into its billionaire founder, Manus. OK, coming up, it is Gates versus McCarthy. As a Republican congressman officially moves to remove the House Speaker, could the balance of power be shifted? Plus... Oil falls for a fourth straight day. We're live to Adapec Energy Conference in Abu Dhabi with India's oil minister right here on Bloomberg. I think the American people deserve to know the coalition that really governs them. And Kevin McCarthy likes to pretend that he makes coalition with conservatives. But all he really does is break his word with conservatives. Uh, the coalition that really runs this country is the uniparty. It is the Biden, McCarthy, Jeffries government. And that is what we will demonstrate with this vote. That was Representative Republican Matt Gates speaking to reporters after he officially moved to topple House Speaker Kevin McCarthy last night. Now, all of this sets up a high stakes vote in a process that hasn't resulted in a speaker being removed since 1910. Joining us now is Bloomberg senior editor Bill Ferries on this. Bill, of course, has extensive experience covering U.S. politics for Bloomberg, so no one we'd rather speak with. Bill, given how long it took McCarthy to become speaker, it was 15 rounds of voting. I remember we talked extensively about it at the time. How big of a surprise is this? Well, it's not a surprise at all in the sense that there was a kind of a devil's bargain that Kevin McCarthy made to get elected on that final 15th uh, round of voting. And that was to give one member of Congress... Any single member could have the power to essentially call for a no confidence vote in his leadership. It's a member, uh, 435 members of Congress. Uh, uh, the Republicans have just a narrow majority. There was always this kind of wild, uh, hard to control right wing group that uh, was never crazy about McCarthy to begin with and, uh, and was really chomping at the bit to have a reason to go after him. Matt Gates is taking that step this week. We'll have to see how it plays out. But it's something that Kevin McCarthy knew from day one in his speakership was always likely to happen. So this could all come down to what kind of support the, the Democrats are prepared to give uh, to McCarthy. Look, if, if you step back from this, what is Congressman Gates doing? And, and what are the chances are that he will...
be able to pull this off. Do you think the Democrats will extract some concessions to get behind McCarthy? What, what's the feeling on the Hill at the moment? It's, uh, there's a whole lot of different scenarios, different ways this could play out. As you said, you know, with, uh, with the narrow majority Republicans have, if, if Matt Gaetz uh, uh, can get five other members of the Republican side to join with him and all of the Democrats, that could be all they need to, to oust McCarthy. I don't know if the Democrats really want to go down that path. They could also, as a block, sit out the entire vote. That would leave, you know, if, if uh, McCarthy just needs a majority of those voting to stay in power, he would have the, still the majority of his own party uh, backing him because this is really a minority that's looking to get rid of him. Mm -hmm. What is Gates doing? He has said he wants to lay the groundwork for a potential President Trump uh, return to the White House. And uh, he wants to go after uh, Republicans he, don't, he doesn't think are willing to fight hard enough. That's part of his strategy. And also, he has just mm. found this to be a good fundraising mechanism. He has sent out uh, emails trying to fundraise off of his efforts to oust the speaker. So what's the timeline for this then, Bill? What happens next? What is the process? Well, uh, under the House rules, they have, to, uh, they have to have this vote that Gates is calling for within two legislative days. You can extend that out quite a bit. One legislative day could just go on endlessly as long as they don't conclude it. But it does seem like Kevin McCarthy wants to get this over with. He said, bring it on. I'm ready to face this. He could call for it as soon as today in Washington. Uh, certainly by, by Wednesday in Washington, we could know the results or where, have a good sense of where this is going. Okay, uh, it's going to go down to the wire, isn't it? It's going to be interesting to see just where the Democrats come down on this bill uh, and whether they do sit it out uh, completely, as you say, and just leave it to the Republicans to deal with their own in-house laundry, so to speak. Bill Ferries on the very latest from Capitol Hill. Quick check on, on the markets this morning. That, that level of, of deep concern that something might break just seems to have paused. Equities are up by an eighth of 1% uh, at the moment. The dollar is still strong. It had a mighty day yesterday. Yields just tip uh, a little bit higher now. 4.68 is where we are. And crude, Masrui from the Adipec conference, the UAE oil minister says we're in the right place. That's the state of play on markets right here on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger in London alongside Manish Cranny in New York. Now, Birkenstock is looking to raise as much as $1.6 billion from its IPO. A company filing says the German footwear maker will sell shares in a range of $44 to $49. That would value Birkenstock at over $10 billion at the top end of the range. The filing says investors include the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund and T. Rowe Price are interested in buying shares. Manis, I just want to know... When are my Dior Birkenstocks coming in the mail? When are you sending them over to me? Listen, I know you're always trying to sort of say to me, now that I'm earning U.S. dollars, I'm going to be able to be generous towards you. All I've got to say, so we've both, it, you know, it's, it's interesting on this show. I look at normal Birkenstocks. What were you looking at? Dior Birkenstocks. Dior Birkenstocks. So I had to look at the men's. $1,000 for a pair of men's Dior Birkenstocks to go to the beach. Are you having a laugh? I mean, maybe, but then you said to me, Manus, it's a lifestyle thing. they're not just thing. shoes. What? Yes, they're not just shoes. It's a they're lifestyle. Imagine yourself on the beaches of the south of France yeah. wearing your Dior yeah. Birkenstocks. It feels right. Let me tell you this. I've done a lot of the south of France. I've done a lot of Saint-Tropez. <laughs> and I tell you what, I didn't do them in a thousand buck shoes. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, wait, I'll wait to see you in your Birkenstocks when you make it to here. But should we talk okay. about... <laughs> Let's talk about Taylor Swift, shall we? I mean, the power of this woman, never mind her music and her record sales. We're not football. The economic impact, it's in the NFL. The TV ratings, they've just had a massive bump, an increase in the money bet on the games amid the excitement, of course, with her relationship or her speculated relationship with the Kansas City's Travis Kelch. Kelchy. So would you, did you, would you watch more football because Taylor Swift is there? Would you come on? Tell the no, truth. No, but I, I, 
I, okay, I honestly, I wouldn't. I'm not the biggest football fan or Taylor Swift fan, but you mm. literally can't avoid it, Manis. It is everywhere on Instagram. It is literally everywhere. Um, but here's here's my fun fact from last quarter, the third quarter. Taylor Swift, Beyonce, and Barbenheimer all, Bar Barbenheimer all together added eight and a half billion dollars to growth in the third quarter. She she is single handedly. Her and Beyonce are supporting this American economy. Well. I tell you what, there's a few jobs uh, that got added in the temporary side with all of those things. I mean, some of the facts on, on, on this Taylor Swift story. Pulling in 2 million additional female fans to the network. So, the, the audience, NBC Sunday Night Football drew an audience of 27 million viewers. That is up 22% on last year. And 2 million more women watched. And the betting on... By the way, his jersey sales are up 400%. He can afford. He can afford these. He can afford the Birkenstocks at a thousand dollars county. I love that Taylor Swift. Let's be honest, is the breadwinner in that relationship, but she's doing so much for his career. She's doing so much for the NFL. So much for the again, American supporting economy. Industry. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> We're off to Adipak next. We've got a conference there. We've got India's oil minister joining Yusuf Gamal Al Din on the ground in Abu Dhabi. Welcome back to Bloomberg Brief. I'm Anna Scranny in New York. And I'm Danny Berger in London. Here's what you need to know. A chorus of hawkish Fed comments dislocates bonds. Loretta Mester suggests that rates may be higher for longer. At this point, I suspect we may well need to raise the Fed funds rate once more this year and then hold it there for some time as we accumulate more information on economic developments and assess the effects of the tightening of financial conditions that has already occurred. Meanwhile, in Australia, the Aussie slides as the RBA keeps rates unchanged, but says some further tightening may be required. And Kevin McCarthy's job is on the line. Fellow Republican Matt Gates officially moves to topple the House Speaker, teeing up a vote that may shift Washington's balance of power. Now, while the drama happens in Washington for this equity market, it's all about the debate unfolding of how much we need to care about higher rates. It definitely dented the Asia session. China is offline for the Golden Week holiday in China, but still the rest of the MSCI Asia Pacific falls more than 1%, almost 1.5% for the lowest level of this year, down 30% from its previous high. European equities, they have run out of steam. They started the morning higher. Now we're just ever so slightly lower. Meanwhile, S&P 500 futures, those also appear to be running out of steam. Manis, I know you've got the bonds in front of you, so I can't help but wonder if this has to do with the turnaround in this bond market, that equities are struggling now to get a bid. Well, I think maybe the bond vigilantes set their alarm clock for 5 a.m. in New York because <laughs> in the past 30 minutes, I mean, we just had that light rollover in the bond market. The Fed speak overnight is very simply put from ING. It's the Fed pushing back against the rate market's protest. In other words, only pricing in 50% probability of another hike. You can see behind me, yields are just incrementally higher. Are you in some kind of a dislocation from normality, according to JP Morgan? That's their view. Schroders have just been with you and I saying rail rates will go to 25 2.75%, and headline rates on the 10-year will go to 5%. We're already at the highest level since 2007. And it's the velocity of the change in rates, perhaps, rather than the destination that is most disconcerting. Ed Yudani uh, says that it is about deficits and supply that are driving the narrative for the bond vigilantes. Now, the dollar flexed its muscle yesterday, rocking higher against sterling, against the euro. And again, the euro just makes a very, very incremental uh, inroads to show some green on the screen. It tanked by nearly 1% yesterday. The chief economist has come out, Philip Lane, and said there is more work to be done. It's going to be hard to sustain these gas prices, the lower gas prices again. So an energy concern going into the winter. Crude is at $88, sub 90 bucks, uh, and it had been dropping uh, for four days in a row. So we're just trying to put it in uh, an eighth of a percent higher. But again, it's the yield spike and the dollar strength that has sort of capped that run in the oil market. Uh, in Adipec at the UAE, of course, you've got Masrui, the oil minister there, saying we're on the right path. So there seems to be no relent from OPEC Plus in terms of the narrative about the cuts and the implementation of those. Danny. Manis, I find this debate really interesting of, of at what point 
are we worried about how high yields have gone? As you mentioned, Schroeder said that it's not until after 5% that we should actually be worried. But Ed Yardeni says that the Fed should be worried now, that they should wake up to higher yields. The question is, are we unduly tight right now, given where the level of yields are? Or does it just make sense? Is this just a logical pricing of higher for longer? Or as Clock Tower saying, we'll catch up with Marco in just a moment. He said he wouldn't catch a falling knife. He salutes those people out there in the bond market that say, now is the time to pick up duration. But it's not the base case for Clock Tower. So stay tuned. Another 10 minutes, and we get the very latest from Marco Papik at Clock Tower. Danny. Well, Manus, certainly the J.P. Morgan CEO, Jamie Dimon, has had some thoughts about this very topic. He's been warning clients and investors to prepare for a worst-case scenario of interest rates at 7%. He spoke to us exclusively on the sidelines of the J.P. Morgan Techstars Leadership Forum in London. Can it go to 7%? The answer is yes. Are there factors that would drive it you know, higher than you know, where it is today? You know, four and a half, four, six, or four, seven, I'm talking about a 10-year bond now. Yes. Uh, is supply and demand could push high? Yes. I'm, I'm just saying be prepared for it. So and, I, and, mm-hmm. and, and then the worst case is stagflation. Mm-hmm. You know, higher rates because you have a booming economy and there's a lot of competition for capital is not the same thing as stagflation. What are, what are the ripple effects of the stress of that? 7% rates on business, on your growth? Well, I'm not worried about J.P. Morgan. J.P. World, you know, we, we're, we are prepared. We can handle 7%. We can handle 2% again. 8%? Yeah, we can handle that too. I mean, that's, I mean, that's, that risk management is not the same thing as guessing the future. Mm-hmm. When risk management looking at the range of potential outcomes and being able to say to yourself, we can handle this, we can handle this, we don't really expect it, and we can handle the in-between. You know, if you bet your company on, you know, one outcome, so I think all companies do that. You know, and every company's got different exposures, you know, input prices, output prices. You know, some interest rates don't matter. Some it's the price of mozzarella. So you know, what's your business? Your business is different. So, uh, but I, I think we don't know the effect of these things in the economy. So they may, we may have a soft landing. We may have a mild recession. We may have a harder recession. You know, obviously there are potential bad outcomes. The, you know, the worst one would be economically is stagflation. Right. Where you have low growth high interest rates, and obviously if that happens, you're going to see you know, a lot of people struggling. Regulators have proposed new capital rules that yeah. banks have said will make it tougher for yeah. Americans to get a mortgage. But I'm curious, when you look across the firm, what businesses are going to have the biggest impact? When you get into the specifics, it really matters how the ultimate rules about mortgages and small business loans, et cetera. In general, you know, it makes, like, you know what I don't like about it, for example, it punishes diversification operating risk capital and GCFE. And diversification is one of the true free lunches for a bank that protects it. And I don't understand why they do that. And I just, you know, we're, we're going to be responding. Hopefully it'll be modified and, uh, and thoughtfully done for international purposes. And mostly, you know, America's got the best financial system the world's ever seen. And, you know, that includes hedge funds and private equity and private capital, all things like that. But this is, you know, I say that private equity hedge funds are dancing in the streets. And this time they're being quite public about it because this is going to push a lot of stuff out of the banking system. And if that's what the regulators want, so be it. Is that good for America? I don't know. Some great lines there from J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon speaking exclusively to Emily Chang. So the bond route continues. You've got multi-year highs. The Fed speak is ratcheting up and the rates market is it a protest from the Fed against this rates market? Let's get to Marco Papich. He is in he is in the west coast of America. His clock tower group does not recommend buying or trying to catch a falling knife in this market. This is what you've got to say, Marco. We do not recommend trying to catch a falling knife. Bonds are not selling off today because of America's poor fiscal profile. The U.S. is not in a debt trap but they may be in the future. So very good morning to you. Explain to me then why we've had such a violent shakedown in this bond market at the moment. Good morning. Good morning to you too, Mattis, and thank you very much for having me on the show. I mean, I think that this move in bonds is, uh, at this moment, purely because of the optimism in the U.S. economy that was severely underestimated by all the Fed watchers. They thought that somehow the 12th Olympian gods on FOMC could somehow slow down the economy with Fed rate hikes. Of course, what was severely underestimated is the strength of the U.S. consumer. And what continues to be completely misunderstood by almost everyone in the markets is that there is no excess savings. That is a completely vacuous argument. 
U.S. households have far more cash from their almost perfectly clean balance sheets um, than anyone really thought. And so that is really powering the economy. And as it does so, bond yields had to reset to this collapse of the recession narrative that's occurred over the last couple of months. The problem, of course, with my view, is that if that's true, then that means that higher inflation expectations or some sort of a debt crisis in the U.S. is yet to be priced if it does get priced in, which means the move on the yields could go higher from here. Okay, I mean, you are, I mean, you say that you're in the mild inflationistic camp. Three to five percent is where we're going to settle. Would that, has that reality hit home, Marco? But more importantly, if that is your reality, then what is the reality of where bond yields actually get to? You know, so when you think about a 10-year fair value yield, there's really three components to it. One is term premium, which has risen because mm -hmm. QE has ended. Then you have the R star, which is what we were talking about until now, just a healthier U.S. consumer than, than anyone really thought. The neutral rate is therefore higher. The long-term inflation expectations hasn't budged at all, Matt. So I'm in this mildly inflationary camp of, let's say, 3% for the rest of the decade. I mean, the five-year, five-year forward is basically telling you we're at 2.4%. It's nailed to the ground. So that's your long-term inflation expectations a little bit forward. Uh, are not much higher or, or lower. And that's what's really fascinating to me after all this extraordinary fiscal stimulus that we've had, after basically the Fed being way behind the curve mm -hmm. in 2021, in my view, still being behind the curve, there's been no rise in long-term inflation expectations. Mm -hmm. And so when you put all those components down together, I think the fair value is somewhere closer to 5%. Uh, but don't be... Don't, don't assume that just because it's around 5%, we're there, and so people should buy bonds. No, there's so many investors. Why, why not, Marco? Why well, can't I buy so bonds right now? We're almost at 5%. <laughs> right. So because so many investors are holding hundreds of billions of bonds with the idea that the fair value is at 3 or 3.5, three and, and if it's at actually 5, then it's likely the yields will overshoot as many investors sell their portfolio of basically overvalued assets. Marco, with that landscape that you've just laid out in front of us, you also put forward the thesis that an outright move to yield curve control in the United States of America, in the long term, I mean, you're not saying it's next week, you're not saying it's at the beginning of next year. Um, we're going to get our comeuppance as a result of this largesse, the unnecessary fiscal stimulus. But what could invoke YCC? Because it's quite a radical thing to say that the U.S. bond market would need YCC. How and why would that come to pass? I think that would be some sort of an uncontrolled move in bond yields towards what, you know, you had uh, Jeremy Diamond talk about, like 7% in the 10-year yield. Um, I think that, you know, let's, let's take it one step at a time. Uh, there is a self-correcting mechanism where once bond yields go over 5%, given where oil prices are, given where the 10-year yield would be at that point, you're starting to have a lot of headwinds to the economy. And if recession risk rises, at that point, I think yields would come down. You know, folks would start moving towards right. the safety. So, yeah, I mean, that, that would be your self-limiting mechanism that where I don't think we would need yield for control. But if we get an uncontrolled move in bond yields, as you saw with the United Kingdom earlier in the year, mm -hmm. what did Bank of England do? Or, for example, after SVB, yeah. what did we do in the U.S.? We instituted the Bank Term Funding Program, which is essentially an American style of European LTROs. Where well, you Marco, use the private I mean, sector. to that point, we're, we're at this moment, and, and again, to that point of the private sector, we're at this moment where debt is moving out of bank balance sheets and, and increasingly into non-banking financial institutions. And we have a Fed whose policy is transmitted through banks. Are, are we about to face a crisis of bond markets that can run away without that helping hand of the Fed? Well, yeah, I mean, if there is no helping hand of the Fed, of course we could. Absolutely. As I said, if the fair value is one and a half, two percent higher on the 10 year yield than most investors have thought, then many are holding overvalued assets on their balance sheet and they will start dumping them. Uh, you know, and in that situation, of course, you have this uncontrolled move, the Fed will step in. And so I think that right now investors are in a very 
very dangerous moment. We're traveling with events. And I think the only real view you can have is on the 10-year yield. And then you have to watch how policymakers react to it. Um, I mean, and if the... So, some, some, some blistering warnings from there. And I, I'm going to quote you again. I mean, I've got to say, I love this note. To you, first of all, you put yourself up as being a heretic. It's brilliant. Um, but yourself and the team there say, I mean, I wish I could be so honest at 5 a.m. on the show. The Fed is merely traveling with events. It's a price taker in CapEx in this cycle defined by structurally higher aggregate demand. I mean, what, what did the Fed try to do in the past 24 hours? Because the rates market is fighting against the Fed. So has the Fed got to do more to regain control here, to regain the narrative? You know, I'm not, I'm not sure that that's what they need to do. I mean, the 10-year yield is in many ways doing what they couldn't do, which is slow down the economy. You know, and that's the point. That's the argument for buying bonds right now. Well, okay, this is un, unsustainable. Well, we'll see. We'll see which level is unsustainable. Um, market moves and paradigm shifts, when they get priced in, they tend to overshoot. That's why I'm not a buyer at this moment. But the point is that as the 10-year yield goes higher, that does increase borrowing costs for the economy, and that will slow down the pace of growth, even with my quite bullish view of the U.S. consumer. And so I don't think the Fed has to regain the control of this. I mean, it really depends what they're trying to accomplish. My issue is that I'm not really sure what they're trying to accomplish. I'm not sure that they know either. Um, and that's why right, well, I think Marco, we will... you, you write in your note that it's clear that the Fed is pivoting for largely political reasons. I mean, that's quite the statement. Is it that clear? Well, why is it clear to you that it's political reasons behind their actions? I think the reason for that is that, you know, inflation has fallen down almost purely for supply reasons. It is very difficult to see any sort of impact on demand by the increase in the Fed funds rate. U.S. consumers have just blown through 5.5% in terms of Fed funds rate increases. Uh, continue to consume. You know, auto sales are up as rates are up. A lot of that has to do with very strong real wage growth. And so what I'm saying is that if the Fed really wanted to get us to 2%, they would have done that by increasing rates more. Instead, they're pivoting away from that. They're pausing right as we get confirmation that the economy is actually quite robust. And so I think the fact that we're 12 months ahead of the U.S. election, they don't want to be political. They, want, they don't want to be perceived as political, which they would be if they induced a recession for the sake of 2% CPI. I think that that is definitely playing a role in them pausing. But they're pausing as they pause and as investors realize that growth is much healthier than it is, that there's really no reason to hold bonds at 3 375 4%. You want to dump them, you want to sell them off, and that's creating this bond yield increase. If they didn't respond to that with some sort of a way to talk down the yields, that will be an uber dovish move that will definitely reveal that they have, you know, sensitivity to a very epic election coming up. Okay, it's certainly going to be epic, and I'm delighted to be on the shores of the U.S. to watch it. Margaret, let's give it a second go. I'll maybe get the name right this time, Marco Pepic. Uh, Clock, Tower, <laughs> Clock Tower Group uh, with his calls on bonds, politics, and an epic election to come. Thank you for staying up in the midnight hours on the West Coast. So the oil market is trying to steady itself. It's virtually flat at the moment, 90.68. We dipped for four days in a row into this session. We're live to Adepec uh, in Abu Dhabi in just a moment on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Brief. I'm Manus Granny in New York. Danny Berger at London HQ. The oil markets are grappling. We're down 6% since the middle of last week. Lots of opinions out there. 90.69 is where we trade at the moment. Flat at the moment on Brent and 88.89. Just ticking into the green for WTI. Let's get to uh, Yusuf Gamal Eldin. He's in Abu Dhabi at Adipec, one of the largest oil conferences. So it's good to see you there. I'm missing it. I'm missing the action. I would say the conversations around those halls uh, will make for good reading. Are we in a good space of where OPEC Plus is at the moment? Yusuf, what's the feeling on the ground? Good morning. Good afternoon. Hey, so you've seen the volatility in the energy markets on both WTI and Brent. I mean, both stabilizing intraday. We were meant to speak to the Indian energy minister 
he got pulled to a meeting and we're going to try and get some FaceTime a little bit later on because we're trying to understand what's behind the increase in shipments from Russia by 15% according to the latest data by Kepler. So even though the thinking was they would phase that out, they're actually not doing that and they continue to leverage the opportunity of cheap Russian energy exports. But of course it is all about what constitutes a fair price in the current state of affairs because when I caught up with the UAE energy minister, Sir Hilo Masrui, he basically said the usual thing. They're not targeting a price. They're watching the demand side of the equation very, very carefully. When you look at the note from Citi in the last 24 hours, there's a good, solid argument to be made around the demand side of the equation and potentially demand out of China not holding up as strongly as many would have anticipated going into the new year. The other thing he highlighted is that they're going to stick by their capacity commitment. So they're looking to get to 5 million barrels per day by 2027. That means within OPEC Plus, they're going to have to look at some of the quotas again. But for this week, no change expected. Danny Manis. Yusuf, what has been the conversation there around the role of the non-OPEC countries? Just less than a minute here, Yusuf. Well, basically, it is that uh, it's being overlooked for the most part. Uh, as much as there's a call for OPEC Plus to increase the number of barrels they deliver to the market, you've got additional barrels coming online from outside of that group, as you highlighted. And the two in particular are the United States and Canada, as they've been ramping up their infrastructure mm. and ironing out some of the initial bottlenecks within the system. So that's going to be a very important one to watch as we get to the end of the year and potentially a new update from Saudi Arabia about their unilateral cuts. Yusuf, thanks so much. That's Yusuf Gamaldin at the Adapec Energy Conference in Abu Dhabi. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger in London. Manus Cranny is in New York. Now let's get you set up for your trading day and a look at what is ahead. Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic will speak on the economic outlook and inflation at 8 a.m. Eastern. His remarks come before the Jolt's job report due at 10 a.m. Now we're also watching out for developments out of D.C. as Congressman Gates moves to formally remove Speaker McCarthy from his post as House Speaker. And the crypto fraud trial against FTX co-founder Sam Bankman Friedman is, is set to begin today. Yep, well, we're going to keep eyes down on that jolts number. Nine million job openings, an increase of 175,000. That's going to be another piece in the bond jigsaw. That was a great conversation with Marco Papich. Uh, the radical mm. thought that you could have yield curve control in the United States of America. But he made his call on fair value, and his fair value is? 5%. Well, 4.5 to 5. Okay. And we asked Manus, okay, why wouldn't you buy now? If not, that's, we're basically there. We're basically there at fair value. His bottom line, I, I thought, was fascinating, which is there's a lot of hands have yet to fold in the bond market because the market exactly. is absolutely convinced the real value should be around 3.5%. So if the hands have yet to fold, how much higher can those yields go? Yeah, exactly. It could overshoot, so uh, maybe now is not the time to buy. All right, that's it for Manus and me on Bloomberg Brief.